Serenby is a place where the innate connections humans have with nature and all living things is celebrated through work and play. And we're here to tell the stories of those who have been inspired by this biophilic way of life in our community and across the country. This is Serenby Stories. We plan on recording 12 episodes of this biophilia focused season, but we couldn't end without talking to Jeff Catch, the chief impact officer of Rodale Institute about the place where life begins, the soil. As Rodale has proven, healthy soil equals healthy food and that makes healthy people. And the healthiest soil is organic and regenerative. Not only is the healthy soil important for us, it's important for the planet. Jeff is responsible for expanding Rodale Institute's global influence to heal people and the planet by unlocking the transformational power of regenerative organic agriculture. He was here with us in Chattahoochee Hills this November to open the Rodale Institute's Southeast Organic Center, one of three new research hubs being opened across the country to increase the number of organic farms and acres in production through training and education. In today's episode, we talk with Jeff about training new farmers, why J.I. Rodale hated the word sustainable, and how Rodale is putting over $2 million into the future of food. But first... Serenby Stories is brought to you by The Inn at Serenby. The Inn is nestled in the rolling countryside of bucolic Serenby, where guests can walk on the 15 miles of trails through preserved forest land, the wildflower meadow, and the animal village. You can relax by the pool, hot tub, or in rocking chairs on the wraparound porch. Play on the croquet lawn, swings, and in-ground trampolines. Connect with nature and each other, all while staying in luxurious rooms on the inn grounds or within the community of Serenby. Book your stay today at serenbyinn.com. Well, I want to welcome everybody back to Serenby Stories today. Today, we have a very, very good friend of ours, Jeff Catch from the Rodale Institute, and of course, Steve Nygren. Welcome. Welcome, Jeff. What an honor it is to be here, Steve. Thank well, you so much. We're always excited when you come here. Yeah. Well, this is one I've been looking forward to for a long time. <laughs> well, good. We've been wanting to get you on the podcast for a while, but you're here for a very special reason. Mm-hmm. We're actually in person today, which is very special. Um, you are here in Atlanta, in Serenby. Tell us why you're here. Yeah. Well, I will start by saying that I would never be here today if it wasn't for the genius work of Steve Nygren helping to connect the dots and making it a reality for Rodale Institute to literally have a physical campus here in the Chattahoochee Hills. So thank you, Steve. Well, we're uh, delighted. <laughs> yeah. So I'm here uh, to, uh, today and this week because we are having an open house um, at a newly established re, uh, regional resource center. We call it uh, the Southeast Organic Center. And it's a, a location uh, that is run by the Rodale Institute, about a mile and a half from where we're sitting right now. And so we're here today because our team of uh, researchers and scientists are opening up our doors to farmers all across the state of Georgia and around the region to, to come and see what we're working on. Uh, we're just embarking on this, this new project and we're all very, very excited about what we're about to do here in the Southeast. Well, and we're thrilled to have you, but you did not grow up in the Institute world, um, the Royal Dale Institute, what I want to hear more about in a minute, but I want to hear about your background um, because you've been into health and wellness for a really long time, but originally you worked for what most people know is Rodale Publishing, mm-hmm. a lot of the magazines that um, Rodale sold off a couple of years ago. So tell us a little bit about how you got to be part of Rodale Institute. Yeah. Um, thanks, Monica. Yeah, it's been an interesting journey and, and a journey at that. Um, my interest in health and wellness actually began at a really young age. So probably around the age of uh, 12 or 13, I had been a very unhealthy adolescent. So most of my young childhood, I have a lot of memories of being sick and making many trips back and forth to the doctor. I had I have two wonderful parents and they cared a lot about me mm-hmm. and were very concerned about my health. And they did like what any good, uh, you know, parent would do at the time and took me to a doctor, a conventional mm-hmm. doctor. And sure. the, the doctor found out that I had... Um, I was dealing with asthma and allergies. Mm -hmm. And so the doctor began treating me with traditional modalities, medicine, treatments, and other things like Mm -hmm. that. And so around the age of seven to let's say 13, I I just remember feeling kind of perpetually sick. Mm -hmm. And um, at the age of 13, I sustained a pretty bad injury, a physical injury that left me uh, on the couch for six weeks recovering. And during that time, I, I, I remember feeling at the lowest point in my life. And just feeling very sad about the state of my, my body. Mm-hmm. And I said, hey, mom, do me a favor. Next time you go to the grocery store, I want you to buy me a magazine. Uh, the mag- and I had just seen this infomercial on the TV. Uh, I said, mom, the magazine's called Men's Health. 
So she goes to the store, buys me a copy of Men's Health. And like any kid growing up in the late 80s, early 90s, you know, a magazine, that's all there was. So you'd read it not once, but like cover to cover like 20 times. <laughs> and, I, and so about a couple of days go by and I say, OK, now, mom, here's a grocery list. I want you when you next time you go to the grocery store, buy me all these foods because this is what the magazine told me to eat if I want to be healthy. And it was kind of like a like a, a an awakening moment for me at a very young age where I said, you know what? My health is in my control. And I'm going to do everything I can to be healthy. And so, starting at that age, I put myself on a diet. I recovered from the injury. And that really kind of set the stage for the rest of my life. I go off to college. I study marketing. Um, was really interested in health and wellness at the time. And as I graduated college, I thought, well, where am I going to work? Where can I put together like this marketing degree with my passions for health and wellness? And I remember literally asking that question to a dear friend of mine. And he said, well, you should go to work at Rodale. And I said, what's Rodale? So I went out and, and at that time it was like around the year 2000. So the internet was becoming a thing. And I did this search on Rodale and I looked at all these products and I was like, oh my God, they're the publisher of Men's Health Magazine. And not only that, but they, the company, the very company was based about 10 miles from where I grew up. So this whole time I had n no idea that there was this entire story behind mm -hmm. this product that changed my life. And so... Um, the following year I graduated from college, I applied for an entry level job in publishing, got hired at men's health magazine, Incredible. Worked, worked one, one year for that brand and then ended up um, spending about 16 total years moving throughout the company and working on various products. But that really began my journey with Rodale. Well, and that actually leads us perfectly into your Serenby story, which I always like to ask, like, how did you come into Serenby? Um, and so I can sort of start us off, but I just sort of love that is that we had a reporter come from a, what at the time was organic magazine. Um, and we toured her around, she stayed for a couple of days and she said, you know, we should do like a show house that talks about all healthy things and organics and all this stuff. And I said, sure, let's, let's do that. And that led to me getting on the phone with you at some point. Cause I think you were the publisher at the time of organic life. That's mm -hmm, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We had just launched that mm -hmm. magazine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and from there, I remember getting on the phone with you and I don't know, I think it was the first time we talked, you immediately told me, or maybe quickly into the conversation that you, what you really wanted to do, right, was work for Rodale Institute. And I was like, well, what's the Rodale Institute? <laughs> and so you started to tell me what it is. Um, and next thing we know, um, here you are at the Rodale Institute, but it, you really came into our lives through marketing. Through the originally. publishing company, mm -hmm, right. Mm -hmm, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Most people don't realize um, our founder, J.I. Rodale, he's widely known as the pioneer of the organic food and farming movement in North America. He actually is credited for coining the term organic as it's used today in relation to agriculture and food. But um, he he's a very interesting, fascinating man. His story was profound. Mm -hmm. But um, along his journey in this in this journey towards understanding organic agriculture, he was so excited about his discoveries that he started a publishing company. In May of 1942, uh. he founded a magazine called Organic Gardening and Farming. And so his, uh, his original sort of way into the organic movement was by launching a physical product, a magazine. And then it was several years later, as he was getting interested, the further he, he went in his journey mm -hmm. of understanding what was fundamentally broken in agriculture the more he realized the need and the necessity for groundbreaking research mm -hmm. to really help um, undergird the, the philosophical ideas that were coming into the fore at that time. He wanted to ground those ph philosophical ideas with science. So he started the Rodale Institute in 1947. We're a nonprofit organization based in Eastern Pennsylvania, and we're 100% focused on doing the science, the research, and the education around helping to advance the organic farming movement. Well, and I always tell people that you guys are the longest running side-by-side -side trial in the world of traditional or conventional versus organic. Is that true? Or am I just making that up? <laughs> no, that's exactly right. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so J.I. Rodale had a son. His, mm -hmm. uh, his son, Robert Rodale, became the leader of the Rodale Institute in the 1970s. And he, among other leaders uh, in the food industry, mm -hmm. uh, they were beginning to see what was happening. They began to see trends and they saw the growth in this organic market. Um, health food stores were popping up. You know, there was sort of that whole back to the land movement that was taking shape. Mm -hmm. And um, there was a just a growing interest in health and in food. And a lot of brands, a lot of na uh, national brands were beginning to co-opt the word organic. 
And Bob Rodale became concerned that organic needed to be defined mm -hmm. and really grounded in science. He felt like it was just becoming more and more esoteric and he wanted to ground it with with research, but also with um, a standard. Mm -hmm. So he and other food leaders all kind of felt the same. And Bob Rodale uh, began going back and forth to Washington, D.C., around the mid to late 70s and asking our federal government to create a standard around this idea of organic. And he and other food leaders basically got laughed out of the room when they said, you know, our, our, I almost imagine our government, you know, saying, yeah, great idea, but it's just an idea. Show us the science. If this organic thing is real and you want us to create federal policy around it, well, we need to prove that it's even a real thing. Mm -hmm. So Bob Rodale, I think, just to prove a point, goes back to Pennsylvania, where Rodale's headquarters are. And in 1981, he started what's now known as the Farming Systems Trial. And it is the longest running side-by-side -side comparison of organic and conventional grain crops in the world. There's no other study that's run for 41 years. And uh, there are now several other studies that have replicated it. But um, nine years into this whole thing, the year 1990, it was the year that our government passed the National Organic Production Act. So it was this one piece of science that gave our government enough conf confidence to create legislation and policy around it. And we now, every time you go to the grocery store and you see that little organic label on food, mm -hmm. it's because of the science that's housed at Rodale. Isn't that incredible? Yeah. Well, one of the things that um, when we first started getting deep into the Rodale side of it, the Institute side, because um, I also remember you coming and telling Steve and I, you know, you guys wanted once you moved over to the Institute side because the magazines were divested and I think Hearst bought them. Yeah, that actually that happened after I left, though. I, okay. had, um, I think it's important to note this. I think around the year 2004, I was uh, at, a, at a pretty young um, age mm -hmm. and at a, at, a, at a pretty early in my career in publishing, I was given the honor of working on the original brand called Organic Gardening. It was a, a magazine that was the founding product inside of Rodale. Uh, and it was kind of, you know, the whole product life cycle, like there's the growth and the maturation and the decline. Mm -hmm. Well, this product had run its course. Mm -hmm. It was about 60 years old at the time. Um, and they needed to kind of just get it into maintenance mode. And so they asked me, I was in advertising and publishing and they said, Hey, listen, you know, you seem like an ambitious guy. Do you want to give it a shot? This product is failing. Do, do, is, do, do whatever you can with it. You know, like we're not expecting much, but um, I was like, absolutely sign me up for that. So I became uh, the publisher, uh, I think at the age of 26 or 27. Wow. And um, what was interesting is about a year after I got put in this position, if you look at the date, the market data starting at around 05, 06, that's when the market, the organic industry, the market just shot up. Mm -hmm. So we, we built a little team on this. It was kind of like the little engine that could organic gardening magazine. And one by one, I would travel across the United States and meet with CEOs and, and ad agencies. And we started selling Ford into the magazine, then Subaru and then General Mills and like all these big brands that started investing in the organic market, started buying media in organic gardening again. And my strategy was unique in that I knew that Rodale Incorporated was also tied to this nonprofit called the Institute. Right. So what I would do is instead of going out to see clients, I would get them to come to us and I would take them one by one to the Institute and be like, this is what Rodale really does. Mm. And every time I'd go out there, I would fall more and more in love with this work. And it just became sort of burnt into me, into my mm -hmm. soul. Like I'm meant to work here someday. And it just stuck with me. It always kind of was in the back of my mind that someday maybe I'll work there. Right. And, and that's kind of how that happened. Yeah. Cause you did go over before everything sort of got sold off. Yeah. And I remember you telling me, you know, we really want to bring more um, research centers across the world, really. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I was like, well, what does that mean? You know, what are you guys planning to do with that? Um, and so tell us a little bit about that sort of seed of idea, which was maybe three, four years ago. Yeah, that's now. exactly what mm -hmm. it was. Right. Um, so, uh, Rodale Institute is housed on it. We have a 333 acre campus in Eastern Pennsylvania. We've been on that campus for just over 40 years and it houses over 26 research projects across all disciplines of agriculture. And it's really become a center of excellence for organic farming in, in, in the world. Mm -hmm. um, every year we play host in a normal year anyway, to about 15 to 20,000 people that come from all over to visit and see and experience. Steve has been there and Monica and um, you know, what we realized was that farming in Pennsylvania is not the same as farming in California or Iowa or even Ohio or Georgia. Mm -hmm. 
And so, yes, farmers would come, scientists would come, consumers would come and learn and train and then go home and implement what they learned. But we thought to ourselves, not every, most farmers don't have the luxury of getting on a plane and taking time away from their own farm and spending money to come and travel. So that coupled with the fact that region by region, agriculture is different. We, we, we believe that Rodale's role in the world was to create more Rodale institutes yeah. so that we could basically take our science out into the world in places where it were most needed. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I think in our, some of our early meetings, Monica and Steve, I, I do recall sharing that that was one of our ambitions was to launch these centers. Mm -hmm. Well, and to bring orga more organic farming mm -hmm. to the country, because I think the other thing that I, I do recall hearing is that, you know, if there was a really robust organic research center in a state, mm -hmm. they had more organic farming. Is that yeah, correct? Yeah, that's right. So, mm -hmm. and, I'll, and I'll give you a great example of that. So um, right now in Georgia, you guys have just under 200 certified organic farms. Mm -hmm. um, the state of Pennsylvania, where I live, we have almost 1400 wow. certified organic farms. And our governor, Governor Wolf, um, you know, was became privy to this data a couple years ago. He saw some numbers that showed that Pennsylvania is now the number two producer of organic food in the nation, second only to the state of California. Wow. And now those numbers have changed a little bit. We might have lost ranking over the last year or two. But at the time, Governor Wolf saw that data and he was excited. He thought, sure. how on earth are we the second largest <laughs> organic production in the, in the country? And his secretary of agriculture said, well, that's easy, Governor Wolf. It's because Rodale's here and they've been here. And by proximity, because Rodale is kind of like a lightning rod in our state for organic, farmers can come and then go home and they can do that in a day trip. Mm -hmm. And we've been doing that year after year, decade after decade. And that's been the fruit of that. And so we feel like if we can create other hubs of activity around organic, mm -hmm. all ships kind of rise with that tide. Many people think of organics as being that boutique farm to table. But actually, you're talking about the agrarian economy. Yeah. And, and how has that uh, developed in Pennsylvania? Yeah, we're talking about reinventing agriculture, you know, and as we're watching, you know, even in Pennsylvania, Governor Wolf was looking at that data and he's saying, wait a minute, there's all these successful organic farms over here, like that are, have a healthy bottom line, but I'm bailing out conventional, mostly dairy farms in Pennsylvania with good taxpayer dollars. He's saying that's not right. And so what Rodale is trying to do is bring our science and our best practice to help create economic vitality, to create a new economy of agriculture all over the United States and all over the world. We believe that the future is organic. Um, our science is proving that the conventional models, conventional ways of producing food aren't working anymore. They're just simply not working. They're not penciling out economically and, bio or, and biologically, they're not performing. Um, we're seeing all kinds of challenges on, on chemical conventional driven farms. Mm -hmm. And our food is not as nutritious because the soil is not as healthy. So that's exactly that's big... right. Uh, the, the, the state of soil health is in an all time decline. Current estimates suggest that if we continue to farm the way we farm using chemical conventional approaches, we have something like 60 irritable growing seasons left before our soils just don't give produce anymore. And if we think this pandemic's bad, imagine if people are starving. Yeah. And yeah. Well, we saw that, Steve. If you, if you look back to February, March, gross, what, what happened? You go into the grocery stores and the shelves were bare. Why is that? Because in, in, well, I'll tell you why. In, uh, during World War II era, during the years, years of World War II as an example, we were growing some 45% of all produce consumed in the United States in our own backyards, 45%. Wow. Fast forward to today during the pandemic, uh, we were at a point where this country is net importing 17% of all the food we purchase. So what a pandemic does is it exposes frailties, right? And I think the pandemic had exposed a massive frailty in our, in our food supply chains. We became so dependent on imports when we have some of the most verdant soils in the world right here in this country. And then you compound that with our human health frailties. I mean, we've, you know, why are we, I think I'm not a, I'm certainly not a medical expert, but it's becoming clear to me that our, the, the immune systems of our citizens are, are weakening and we're becoming more frail in, in our ability to handle, you know, these, these kinds of health challenges. What did you see? I mean, what you're proving is when the soils are not healthy, the plants aren't healthy, and that's when bugs and disease, and we're the same thing. <laughs> As the soil goes, we go. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. You have a great saying about that. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm glad you invited that because it, I would be remiss to not share the mission of Rodale. Uh, J.I. Rodale 
I did mention that he was not a, I may have mentioned he, he was not a farmer when he started his work. He was actually a businessman, an entrepreneur, much like you. And uh, he had a real interest in health. And so he thought to himself, well, if I could buy a farm and grow my own food, then that I could empower myself to be healthy. So he did. He actually came out to Pennsylvania. He actually moved his manufacturing business out of New York City into Pennsylvania, set up shop because it was lower cost of living, lower labor rates, and and, and then thought, well, if I'm living in Pennsylvania, then I'm going to buy a farm too so I could raise my family and grow my own food while I run my business. So he buys a farm, a 60-acre dilapidated farm, mm -hmm. and he says, okay, now I got to go learn how to farm. And he goes out and he meets with the local extension agent. Okay. There was an extension agent at our meeting this morning. Um, and I can almost imagine how the conversation went. He said, okay, how, J.I. Rodell, you want to know how to farm? And he said, yep, I want to know how to farm. He said, it's really simple. You go out and you buy these things called inputs, chemical inputs. They're all the rage right now. And you bring them onto your farm and you apply them to your soil. And that's how you grow food. And he's like, oh, okay, I, I have a manufacturing company. I make, I make products. And I know that if I want to make the very best products, I need to bring in inputs into my factory. And if I bring the higher quality of the inputs, the better outputs. And he thought, okay, if that's how farming works, then that's how farming works. But can someone please explain to me what magic happens in the soil that would take toxic synthetic pesticides and herbicides and turn that into healthy food? Can someone please explain that to me. And of course, no one could. And so that's, that was sort of like a, a light bulb moment for J.I. Rodale, where he wrote these words literally on a chalkboard. And he said that healthy soil equals healthy food equals healthy people. And that's been our mission statement ever since. And so what he was essentially saying, I think what J.I. Rodale was saying in those words, and you were just alluding to it, Steve, that our job as farmers is not to produce food. What J.I. Rodell was saying is that our job as farmers is to produce healthy people. And so right now in 2020, as our world faces this pandemic, we should be looking to our farmers as the solution to find our way out of this. Mm. Yes. I mean, several people have said, you know, rural America is not where the problem is. It is where the solution is. Yes. And that's true with if, if we had treated our soil correctly and our grazing, we would not have a carbon problem. Mm -hmm. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I recently gave a talk at a, um, uh, in back in September, the United Nations does an annual um, global day of action. And uh, there was a conference, a sub conference to that called the Food Forever Conference. And it was all virtual this year. So I gave a talk and, you know, the United Nations has the 17 global sustainability goals, I mm -hmm. believe it's called SDGs. And I was reading the goals as I was writing my speech uh, the, the morning prior and I was like, wait a minute. I went one by one through all these, these goals around climate, carbon sequestration, um, human health, hunger, water, air, all these goals around all the biggest issues that we know of. And I, I connected the dots that agriculture and soil health fixes 14 out of the 17. Wow. And that, that's what, that's a big message that needs to get out. Um, mm -hmm. It's incredible. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and now more and more me people are messaging. I, I know you've seen kiss the ground, mm -hmm. which just <laughs> tells your story. Yeah. 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 It almost feels like this is our moment. You mm -hmm. know, we're seeing all these, you know, and even today I was, I had the opportunity to meet with um, about 20 farmers from around the state of Georgia. And then uh, shortly thereafter, we had a virtual, uh, conference this afternoon, mm -hmm. which Monica attended and, you know, had a hundred people from around the United States that are so focused on what we're doing. That's just a microcosm of what I've been experiencing this year. This year in and of itself has accelerated the work of regenerative agriculture, unlike any other moment in recent history. We have seen such momentum for our movement. And I think it's because it's our world is ready for it. Well, and <laughs> you just had a really good word there. And I don't know if you brought it up yet is regenerative. Mm. So talk a little bit about regenerative, because that was something also that I sort of started to learn from you a few years back. That regenerative is a is another level beyond organic. Yeah. In in what is that? Yeah, glad you brought that up, Monica. Mm -hmm. um, so J. I. Rodale, our founder, is widely credited for coining the term organic, mm -hmm. um, which is a biological process to agriculture as in term in, instead of a chemical process. Mm -hmm. We're basically working with nature to grow to produce food and mm -hmm. to create healthy soil. Um, that that word rang true for a long time. And around, around the 1970s, Robert Rodale, J.I.'s son, 
he was a world traveler mm -hmm. and um, would often travel to very third world parts of, of the world uh, that were struggling with agriculture. And at that time, the word sustainability was coming into vogue. And Robert Rodale thought that was, he hated that word. He thought it was a really poor choice of words to describe anything worth sustaining. He thought to, he would look around um, where he'd go at these often arid, um, desertified uh, agricultural settings in mm -hmm. Africa and other places. And he would look around and he'd say, sustainability? There's nothing here to sustain. <laughs> and mm -hmm. he thought to himself, wait a minute, if we begin to look at agriculture through the, re through the lens of regeneration, if we start with improving the health of the soil, if we get our farmers in these places to think about the soil and regener just regenerate the soil, well then guess what? To your point, Steve, the nutrient uptake, the nutrient density of the food and the plants themselves flourish. The people consuming that food flourish. The farmers flourish. And little by little, entire communities get better and better and better over time. And he said, regeneration. And then he went back and that became Bob Rodale's whole platform for a long time was this idea of regeneration. And in recent years, we, we've seen an entire industry begin to shift its attention. So organic is now becoming a, a, you know, a very mainstream conversation. But like any good industry, you always want to innovate, right? How do you push the bar higher? No one knows that better than you, Steve. You're always thinking beyond. How can I push further? And so Rodale Institute in recent years has sat down with some leaders in the food industry and we've launched the newest, highest bar standard in food production. It's called the Regenerative Organic Certification. And it's really moving beyond just this idea of getting chemicals out of a, of a system, but it's now a uh, regenerative, ag regenerative organic agriculture encompasses three main pillars. Uh, the first is soil health. Mm -hmm. The second is animal welfare. How are, the, how are the animals in our agricultural systems being treated? And then thirdly is human well-being. How are the human workers in our farming systems being treated? Are they being pay paid a fair wage? Mm -hmm. Are they be being given access to health care and, and other means? So regenerative organic agriculture is a very high bar that we've set for food and farming. It's incredible. Now, clearly, you you really do have the formula that could save planet Earth and, mm. and, and the, the people on it. But how are you going to save the farms and match them with young farmers? What are you doing there to yeah. make all this in practice? Yeah. I, you know, the statistics uh, show that there are currently six times the amount of farmers over the age of 65 than there are under the age of 35. So over the next 10 years, we're going to see millions of acres of land change hands. And Rodale is very aware of that and is working very hard. Um, so in addition to research, the second pillar of our work is farmer training and education. We at Rodale Institute house uh, many interns um, from all over the world that come in and physically live, not just as, at our campus in Pennsylvania, but we're going to be having a steady stream of interns here in Georgia and our, at our campus in Iowa and our campus in California, as well as we're, we're moving aggressively into online farmer training. But we have to work really diligently to train the next generation of farmers. But I have to tell you, I am, I am more encouraged than, any, than ever before um, because I'm seeing so many bright young people that are highly educated. We're talking about masters and PhD level young people that are, that are choosing agriculture as their career path. And they're coming to learn and train from us and from many other great organizations that are training farmers. It's exciting. And so once they're trained, how are you matching them with land? Because they don't always have the money to do that. Yeah, well, uh, the reality is, is, you know, that's a whole other area of expertise. So we're working with other partners to try to work towards that end. You know, that's probably not Rodale's role to play, but there's some other like-minded organizations like the Conservation Fund who are helping to match farmers with land. So, you know, Rodale doesn't do anything in isolation. We do everything in partnership. That's why we're here with you. Um, and so we, our doors are wide open, but we, we do want to play a role in training the farmers and then work with other like-minded partner organizations to get those farmers placed on land. And can you talk about the relationship with the Conservation Fund? Is that Yeah, absolutely. So um, we have built a great relationship. Um, thank, thank you for making that connection. And uh, we're, so Conservation Fund is another national organization. Uh, their main focus is working on uh, preserving and maintaining uh, wild places. So farmland and other, other um, 
other public land use. Uh, but right now they're very focused on, on farmland and ranch land and getting that land not only preserved and protected in perpetuity to ensure that it's always used for agriculture, but they're also creating a, a new farmer's fund to give young farmers access to land and capital to get their farm started. And then what Rodale's going to offer is the training and the technical assistance for on, to make sure that those farmers are successful long-term. It's a great program. Great. Thank well, and you. I felt like at the end of the um, virtual uh, call and webinar today on, uh, that was launching the research center, Jeff Moyer kind of dropped like a $2 million bomb at the end that I felt like kind of <laughs> was the lead. Um, can you tell me a little bit about that? That's taking from your, the Institute's um, foundation or yeah. Did tell you just me say that Jeff, Jeff Moyer buried the lead? I think he buried the lead. Well, Monica, I, 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 I think it was the bridge to the next story. It was the bridge to the next story. <laughs> but at the end, he was like, oh, and by the way, we're um, taking $2 million from our, you know, um, the, the foundation or the endowment, and we're setting it aside to help train and grow new yeah, farmers. I, I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. Where did, yeah, you know, so tell me a little bit about that. About that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for reminding me. Yeah, so tell, yeah. tell us a little bit about it, because I was like, I wanted to know more, but I was heading off Yeah, no, call. so this is very exciting. Um, mm-hmm. There's so many organizations, especially on the financial side, that are bubbling to the surface right now. Mm -hmm. There is a financial institution that Rodale has developed a fantastic partnership with. It's called Iroquois Valley Farms, and they're a real estate investment trust. Mm -hmm. So it's an investment strategy Mm -hmm. started by a couple of entrepreneurs, very visionary entrepreneurs Mm -hmm. that are that are looking at the data and they're looking out and they're seeing the growth and the the demand for organic food that's grown domestically. And they're seeing there's a shortfall right now. So, so the the total U S food economy, uh, about 6% of all food purchased in the United States is certified organic. Mm -hmm. About 14% of all produce purchased in the United States is certified organic. 80% of all households in this country bought at least one organic item in the past month. Wow. With all that said, um, we're only producing about 1%, 1% domestically. So we're, st- we're net importing. There's a shortage of certified organic acreage in this country and a strong demand and pipeline for it. Mm-hmm. Consumers want it. Farmers aren't, aren't delivering it yet. Okay. So these guys at Iroquois Valley, Iroquois Valley have created a whole investment strategy that's allowing you and I to invest in organic farmland. We can put our money, our retirement, our 401ks, hmm. we can imp- invest into this investment portfolio And what Iroquois Valley is doing is buying land, transitioning it to organic, and then putting farmers on that land. And Rodale is working with them to make sure that those farmers are set up for long-term success. So yes, Rodale Institute, we are a nonprofit. We're a very humble nonprofit. We, um, all of our financials are available publicly, Um, but we do have some small endowments that have been given over the years, Mm -hmm. very modest. And we have decided to take 2 million of those modest endowments and invest it with Iroquois Valley. So we can say that we're putting our money where our mouth is. So impressive. That's a super, super cool idea. Um, but clearly there's a business here. You know, if we're only build, growing 1% and they and we're eating 6 to 14, depending on the product, there's a clear business here. And, you know, people need to get on the, is it the bandwagon? And um, start farming. I know that we're, we've been talking about this and we were sort of doing it, but tell us a little bit about, you know, Southeast is not the only one that you're opening right now. You also opened two others, one in Iowa and one in California, just, I believe this past 18 All months. The same so, year. Yeah. Oh my God. Congratulations. So tell us a little bit about like, what are you hearing from the farmers? I know you met with Southeastern ones today, but like what kind of research and needs do they have across the country? Yeah. It's, it's well, it's a great question, Monica, because it's, it differs from region to region. Mm-hmm. The need is different. So here in the Southeast, you know, we saw the decimation of the cotton and tobacco industries over the last decades that have left many of these family farms struggling mm-hmm. and they, they, they lack markets they lack access to capital and they lack technical assistance and okay. research. So Rodale is here trying to solve for all four of those things. We are doing research on the ground that is going is helping understand the needs of farmers in this region. What are their growing challenges? What are their soil health challenges? And 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 what are their pest challenges? And so we're going to set up research to help help overcome those barriers. We're going to hire, um, with funding, we're going to hire consultants that can then go out onto the farms and hold the hands of those farmers through those difficult times. Mm -hmm. And then thirdly is we're creating access to markets. So 
we have markets for small, medium, and large scale producers. Um, we're going to be creating local food hubs here. We're actually, we just um, submitted for a massive grant that would allow us to create a mobile farmer's market to go into our inner city populations Amazing. and take, right, take produce from all these wonderful farms right here in the Chattahoochee Hills, get that produce onto our refrigerator vehicles and trucked into our inner cities where there's low income, low access. Another example of market opportunity is with Emory, Emory Healthcare. Uh, in partnership with the Conservation Fund, Emory Hospital, their hospital system has guaranteed the long-term procurement of organic produce that we can, that our fo- farms in this community can produce. They will buy it all. Amazing. And give these farmers long-term contracts. And then the last example I'll share and this is consistent for all, all these barriers. They're not unique to the regions. Mm-hmm. They just look different in each region. But it's in every region, it's the lack of understanding and the research. It's the lack of technical assistance, access to markets and capital. And so um, I want to end this with uh, this segment by saying that, um, you know, there's a there's a large scale poultry produ- producer in the Northeast called Bell and Evans. It's a family owned business. Mm-hmm. Um, if you purchase an organic chicken at Whole Foods Market, it likely was produced by Bell and Evans. It's a wonderful family. And they are the family, the CEO uh, and the founder of the company has committed to only purchase U.S. domestic organic grain to feed chickens. He will not import a stitch of uh, imported grain. And as such, he challenged Cargill, which is the largest commodity producer in the world. He said, listen, I'm willing to give you a long term contract. I, you know, I'll buy your grain if you can create a supply chain of domestically grown, organically grown corn and soybeans. And Cargill accepted the challenge and they are going to work with Rodale Institute and um, our institute and our consultants will be working with Cargill's farmers to ensure those farmers are doing it right and doing it to the Rodale standard. And we're going to, it's going to open up market opportunity for farmers down here in the Southeast. It's going to open up market opportunities for farmers in the Midwest, anywhere where grain production can take place, Cargill and Bell and Evans are creating markets. And that's just one example. Wow. Mm -hmm. And another area that you're doing research is hemp. That yeah. Yeah. It's very exciting. Yes. Tell yeah. us about that and yeah. some of the so, futures that you see there. Right. So, we, you know, hemp was actually illegal to grow in Pennsylvania for over 80 years. <laughs> um, this is bizarre legislation. Uh, we're not talking about the psychoactive form. We're talking about industrial hemp, mm-hmm. which has insane amounts of applica- commercial application. Uh, essentially, anything created, uh, anything that's created with plastic could be done with hemp. So, Rodale, about six years ago, right when there was some legislation that opened up the ability for us to grow hemp for research, we were first in. And we've been studying hemp uh, at our headquarters in Pennsylvania. And we'll be doing some of that work down here too. But we think that hemp could become a major antidote for many farmers in that hemp is an incredible... uh, weed suppressant. It's also very good for soil remediation. Mm-hmm. If there's ever a, like sort of a, 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 to, a toxic effect in your soils, hemp does an incredible job hmm. building fertility in the soil. Wow. Um, and it also has incredible uses. It's a very high value crop, so it could open up a lot of economic opportunities for farmers. Mm-hmm. Well, and I think that the market pressures are really interesting to me as a consumer. You know, when we had our kids in sort of that 05, 07 time period when organic was coming up, that kind of flipped a switch to be more thoughtful about what we were purchasing. Mm. And then we moved to Serenby and we backed up to a farm and that sort of heightened it even further, right? Um, obviously our relationship with you, but you, one as a consumer sometimes feels a little... Um, you know, that we don't really, I don't really know if I can have an impact, right? So knowing that I can support Rodale and you guys can work with a Cargill, which is a huge, what I think of as like a more industrial, Mm -hmm. you know, not manufacturer, agricultural um, system that maybe I have a negative idea about, but that you guys are going into sort of the belly of the beast, if you will, and talking to them and saying, Hey, we have a market for you because they're businesses. They have to under, they, you know, they, they're smart. They know that if they have a market for it, they'll shift away from the more industrial agriculture into an organic opportunity. So I'm always looking for, you know, how can I tell other people, where can we go to, you know, have purpose and make a difference? Because just myself buying organic is good, but it doesn't feel like I'm really making a difference to change the world. But I do really feel like Rodale is one of the major answers for us Mm. to really make a difference. Yeah. Well, Monica, I'm really humbled by what you just shared. Um, Most days we feel like David and Goliath. 
you know, <laughs> it, it feels that way. Mm-hmm. You know, we, we are, we, we, we consider ourselves to be the voice of reason in this movement. We are not agnostic in who we work with. Mm-hmm. Uh, we, we will work with anyone that wants to transition <laughs> acres and move in the direction of regenerative organic agriculture, including Cargill. And, mm-hmm. you know, it's possible we may get criticized for that, but our goal in working with Cargill, we're a nonprofit. We're not going to generate all kinds of revenue from that relationship, but we have impact. We can mm-hmm. impact some of the largest companies in the world with our research and our best practice. And we're going to do that yes. all day. Now, which I love. And as the market starts to question it and there's more focus on health, then they will start changing because it, the market's going to demand it. Yes. Yes. Well, and I believe that when COVID hit, um, we did see numbers go up in organic purchases. It's been, this year has been one of the biggest growth years in recent history. Um, I just saw a statistic that direct farm sales, direct to, consu- direct to consumer farm sales were up 420% year over year. That's incredible. We've yeah. seen it here with our farm. I mean, we immediately went to like a drive through and sort of mask and all the things and it, we blew doors. People were demanding yeah. the produce. So you're going to have quite a task because is there's a greater awareness, the market increases, but the product uh, um, production with farmers, the, the, that's going to take some time to ramp up. Yeah. Yeah. We're gonna, we're trying to scale uh, the, the velocity mm-hmm. of organic farmers coming online and building up a, a true supply chain. Uh, it is taking time, but we're seeing the adoption and it's happening like by the day. It's very exciting. And, you know, we read the stories now. Uh, people are reevaluating where they live and you can work remotely. And then one uh, parent is, is leaving work because of the whole school situation mm. is sort of changing. Farming is a great way that you can be at home and still take care of the kids and educate the kids on a whole uh, deeper level. Many times farm kids. Mm-hmm. Are you talking about that or yeah, is there any stories? Um, I think the National Gardening Association came out with some data just a few months ago that said that there were 22 million new gardens added to our backyards this million? year because of the pan- because of what wow. you just described, Steve. Wow. So what's been fascinating to me, and, and I, I'm, I have the honor of sitting on your board of uh, at the Biophilic Institute, what we're seeing um, more than any other time in recent history is just humans reconnecting with nature and getting into their own backyards and realizing that there's this amazing miracle that can happen by getting your hands and your children's hands in the soil and planting something and cooking a meal together. And I am so overjoyed to see that miracle has been accelerated because of this terrible thing that's maybe, you know, hit us, I guess, if you will, but so many good things coming out of it and just people gardening again, cooking again, being at home with each other in their backyards. You know, I don't I don't see any downside to that. Do you? And, and some of these people might decide to have a bigger garden, which will turn <laughs> into a farm, right? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Well, I'm going to leave it on that. That was a great way to end it. I thank you so much. I'm so glad we could do this in person. It's so good to see your face, even though I'm not allowed to hug you right now. <laughs> it's been my, <laughs> my, my honor to be here. I'm, I'm grateful to both of you and for uh, Sarah and B and, your, you know, this whole community for embracing Rodale in the way that you have. Um, to our, 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 our sponsor farm, our hosts, Ross and Rebecca Williams, and uh, the connections, Steve, all the connections you've helped to make. You guys have been wonderful hosts and you've, you've created a movement down here. So thank you so much. Well, clearly Rodale is, is, is a key answer to the agricultural part. And so we are just thrilled to support in any way. And Jeff, your, your enthusiasm and the way you can articulate the issues uh, really is going to help move, move the movement forward. So thank you for your passion and everything you're doing. Thank yeah. you. Thank you guys. Thank you for listening to Serenby Stories. New episodes are available on Mondays. Please rate and review the podcast and visit our website to learn more about upcoming guests, episodes, and everything biophilia at serenbystories.com.